Mr. Shafiev, recent events in Tobos region of Azerbaijan between Armenia and Azerbaijan attracted the attention of the full international community. Can you comment on the reasons of the recent event in July, as I said previously, between Armenia and Azerbaijani armed forces, and overall the development in the context of the conflict between two countries? Well, thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's analyze what's going on uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. First, let's start with the events in, in Tovus region of Azerbaijan on the international border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There are many uh, opinions uh, who started first and what was going on, etc. But uh, let's see uh, overall military and geopolitical situation and specifically Tovus region. Uh, Azerbaijan doesn't have any military advantages, let's say tactical advantages, launching uh, attack at the international border with Armenia. I believe there are four reasons uh, which uh, was conducive uh, to the Tovus clashes and all these four reasons indicate that it was Armenia who, which was interested in uh, igniting or reigniting the conflict specifically in Tovus region. First of all, as I said, we don't have any tactical, Azerbaijan doesn't have any tactical advantages in this uh, region because it's the international border. Uh, it is Armenia which wanted to draw the third party to the conflict. And uh, we really, we, we have seen, we witnessed that uh, the next day after Tovus clashes, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia, uh, Zohrab Natsikanyan, uh, made a phone call to the Secretary General of the Collective Security Treaty. And, uh, you know, the information was it was the consultation, sort of consultation. Uh, the meeting was uh, called and then postponed. Uh, definitely uh, Armenia wanted to involve a collective security treaty to the conflict, uh, but specifically I believe uh, Armenia wanted to draw Russia. Because what, what happened four years ago, for example, in April 2016, where it was also attempt by Yerevan, the government in Yerevan to uh, involve collective security treaty, but at that time they received response that the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh region and uh, other adjacent region are not the jurisdiction of Armenia and thus it's not jurisdiction of collective security treaty. But the clashes in the international border between Armenia and Azerbaijan it gives kind of the reason for collective security to be involved. So I believe that was the reason why Yerevan was much more interested in Tawus clashes than Azerbaijan. The second uh, reason, uh, uh, the Tawus region is in proximity to major international transregional energy and transport infrastructure. We know that Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan, uh, oil pipeline, Baku, Tbilisi, cars, uh, gas pipeline, Baku Tbilisi cars railroad all goes uh, in quite close proximity to the Tawus region to the clashes and Armenia uh, it's it, it kind of not secret we are uh, left isolated from these transregional projects because of its uh, occupation occupational policy towards Azerbaijan and uh, Yerevan is not happy that Azerbaijani gas by the end of this year will be delivered to, the, to Europe, to European market, uh, to Italy, Greece. So uh, threatening, I mean, making escalation exactly in this region uh, serves the purpose uh, to threaten uh, major energy and transport infrastructure. The third reason, uh, I believe, is the Armenian domestic politics. We know there is the, the fight between the current government, Pashinyan, led by Nikol Pashinyan, Prime Minister, and um, other parties, whereas so-called Karabakh clan, uh, previous leaders, Kacharyan, who is in prison, and this is and there's tension with Sarkisyan. Uh, we've seen uh, also the tension related to some of oppositional parties. Uh, Tsarukyan, for example, uh, also was imprisoned, arrested. 
Uh, so uh, always, I mean, it's the kind of classical uh, method when the, the government would like to detract attention of the domestic audience from the domestic affairs. Uh, it uses some external threat uh, for these purposes. And also the fourth reason I believe the, uh, is the um, difficult economic situation in Armenia, uh, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Situation became worse and uh, I think again the external threat always uh, useful uh, for, the, for the, the government to detract attention uh, from the domestic affairs. Somebody can also claim that Azerbaijan might be interested in uh, stirring up the conflict and uh, channeling uh, domestic attention to the external threat, to the conflict. But uh, according to all available data, uh, economic data, financial data, Azerbaijan situation, yes, uh, Baku, the government in Baku also uh, feels the stress because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, the financial economic situation is much better in Azerbaijan. And the, the financial reserves, the, the currency reserves, uh, which Azerbaijan accumulated so far, it's around $15 billion. So the situation is, is, is much better in Azerbaijan. So uh, the government was not compelled to do anything. I mean, the situation oh, is under control. Mr. Shafif, it's, yeah. it's, it's really interesting point mm. and a very controversial point from the international opinion, international view, because Azerbaijan claims that mm. Armenia started its provocation this time and mm. also in 2016, I mean, mm. the April. And from the other side, Armenian claims that it's Azerbaijan who started this provocation. Mm. So I would like to draw your attention to the recent statement made mm. by Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan during his interview for mm. BBC Hard Talk, where he said that it is necessary to establish the international mechanism mm -hmm. to investigate the cases of ceasefire violations. Mm -hmm. And from his words, this is valid for Armenia. Mm -hmm. Your opinion, is it also valid for Azerbaijan? Uh, the, the desire of Armenia to establish uh, this uh, sort of monitoring system, uh, the goal of this monitoring system is to uh, solidify status quo, especially on the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. I think Azerbaijan should openly declare that the, the goal of the negotiation process is desirable to have peaceful resolution, but it's not the goal. The goal is the implementation of United Nations Security Resolution. The goal is the uh, restoration of international law, restoration of territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Under international law, Azerbaijan has every right, you know, self-defense, to uh, resort to uh, military means. But again, Azerbaijan shows a goodwill and now for 26 years after ceasefire in 1994, uh, Azerbaijan working on peaceful resolution through diplomatic channels. And as a former diplomat, I also prefer that eventually we'll come to the peace through the uh, uh, peaceful means, through diplomatic means. But I would like to stress that the, the uh, non-military solution is not the goal. Uh, the, the goal is the uh, restoration of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. But uh, looking also at the the history of this ceasefire and you know this suggestion about establishing the con control system. Look what happened, especially you, you quoted Nicole Pashinyan, uh, what happened at the negotiation table uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan for the past two years. Nicole Pashinyan came to power in 2018 and it was quite optimistic sentiments in the air because he was sort of mm, pro-democracy, he was speaking about the peace, uh, about, uh, you know, liberal values, etc., etc. And indeed we had some, some uh, kind of uh, time of optimism. In the beginning of 2019, uh, leaders of two countries met in Dushanbe and there was some sort of the elevator talks, etc. But what happened after that? Uh, in March 2019, Pashinyan, tried to derail negotiation process by uh, 
trying to uh, involve the so-called Nagorno-Karabakh into negotiations. You know, the, the format of negotiations, the goal of negotiation is to define the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. If we will refer to the founding documents of the Minsk Conference, that's the March 1992, that's the two sides of the conflict. Armenian and Azerbaijan, elected and other officials of Nagorno-Karabakh can be drawn or invited uh, to the negotiations table upon consultation with all parties. And in September, on 15th September 1992, chairman of the Minsk conference, at that time it was Italy, uh, made a statement where uh, the chairman uh, clarified that uh, when we're speaking about elected and other uh, representative of Nagorno-Karabakh, we should treat equally Armenian and Azerbaijani community. Because statement says that uh, the, the chairman didn't find uh, why Armenian community should be given more preference to, uh, to Azerbaijan. So something uh, along these lines. I, I don't remember exact quote, but the, the, the essence of that statement was both communities should be involved in the negotiations. But they should be involved after some progress achieved. We don't have this progress. So, in March 2019, Pashinyan first time tried to derail the, the, the negotiation process. And then, there was the meeting, uh, summit meeting in Vienna in the end of March 2019. There was also some conversation about uh, preparation of population to peace. And what Pashinyan did? He went to uh, Hankendi, uh, to the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, to launch so-called uh, Pan-Armenian Games, and he declared that Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenian, period. Basically, again, he is derailing, destroying the Minsk format, because the, the goal is to define the situation around Nagorno-Karabakh, region of Azerbaijan. And then Armenia declared that basically it's the return to the old slogan, Miatsum, which is an Armenian means unification. We remember that in February 1988, uh, Armenia and uh, Armenian nationalists began this campaign uh, exactly with the uh, term unification, Miatsum. And Pashinyan returned to this term. Uh, it should be noted that after gaining independence, Armenia in 1991, as well as Azerbaijan, uh, the Armenian nationalists abandoned. The, the, the term unification, because what means unification? That means enlargement of Armenian territory. Instead of this sort of, which is not well received by the international community, when one country trying to get the territory of another country. So the Armenian nationalists came with a bit, bit smarter idea of self-determination, because self-determination draws much more sympathy, especially in the Western liberal circles. But the goal, and uh, Pashinyan uh, reaffirmed that, is indeed to unify, to uh, annex Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. Let me continue. That was the second attempt to completely destroy the negotiation process. And the third one, uh, this year, uh, Armenia uh, in, in March, April denied the existence of uh, documents at negotiation tables. We know that for almost 10 years now, the both sides working on the solution, which is called Madrid Principles. And by declaring that there is no negotiation, there is no uh, documents on negotiation table, basically Armenian side uh, fully denies the all results of the negotiations so far. And uh, by the way, even like usually uh, Moscow, the Russia has balanced approach to this conflict. Even in this case, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, uh, making comments in April 2000, uh, 2020, he said that no, there is the documents on the table and it, they should be elaborated further. And, uh, uh, you know, both sides should work on it. And finally, I mean, in, in, uh, on May 21st, Nikol Pashinyan went to Shusha, which is a historical city of Azerbaijan. All international experts accept that Shusha is, is the uh, Azerbaijani city, I mean, culturally. Uh, and that was, I think, the, uh, the quite uh, strong provocation. 
And after all that, uh, Armenia is still talking that, no, we should establish monitoring system, etc., etc. When we see that for the next, uh, for the last two years, Armenia deliberately tried to destroy negotiation process. And one more thing, uh, we're speaking about the, again, returning to a question about the control system. Uh, let's look at the data. 2019 was the lowest number of casualties at the contact line. So that basically manifests that Armenian and Azerbaijan can handle and can uh, keep uh, the this ceasefire regime. Uh, but now Armenia destroyed the negotiation process and uh, 2019 was indeed lost year and we are uh, again speaking about some ceasefire control etc. Well in 2019 we had perfect ceasefire, I mean a relatively perfect ceasefire. So I believe again the, this system of control which uh, Yerevan is speaking is the, the goal of this uh, controlling system is to solidify status quo.